very heartwarming evening to all for being here with us for MindDisc. Let's program a peaceful mind, a Techno India group initiative. We have two panel discussions coming up. The first one, technology in education, followed by its impact on mental health. We all know that the pandemic has led to upheavals in our professional and personal lives, and all seems to have gone for a topsy-turvy. Since March 2020, we have been striving to adapt to a new normal, which though initially seemed too daunting, has now become very much a part of our daily routine and lives. Apart from masks and sanitizers, technology has become an overwhelming necessity overnight. The old vanished in a flicker and the new was forced upon us. This evening's webinar will focus on the more intensive and extensive use of technology in all facets of life. The purpose of the, this webinar is to find out what will be the state of our mental health when our lives will be overpowered by technology, its pros and cons, and most importantly, how this tech invasion will impact our relationships and the human touch, both at work and in family lives. And to moderate the first session of the evening, Technology in Education, we have with us Mr. Meghdoot Roy Choudhury, Director, Global Operations, Techno India Group. Techno India Group has always believed in the power of the youth who are the future of the nation. Youth at its dynamic best, Mr. Meghdoot Roy Choudhury's hallmark list is lengthy. Educationist, Mr. Meghdoot Roy Choudhury is an entrepreneur, public speaker, a startup mentor, music producer, community builder, and a social change maker on a mission to redefine the future of education. Director Global Operations at Techno India Group, one of the largest educational conglomerates in India, he has been driving a new wave of experiential interdisciplinary learning for adults through the recently established Offbeat CCU, a school of the future. He started his first venture, a music recording studio by the name of Blooper House Studios at the age of 19, which has still now produced more than 2,000 albums and artists from across the world. He also runs a co-working space startup incubator called Technopreneur Surrogate Ventures in Kolkata. He has received the eminent Young Entrepreneur Award at the Times Knowledge Icon 2018 in Kolkata, India, for his work in the field of promoting young entrepreneurs and initiatives in emerging technologies. Propelled by bountiful enthusiasm, and the zeal to discover new vistas, he has added a new dimension to the group and made it the hub of happenings, which will take the group to newer heights of success in the coming days. Thank you very much, Dr. Mukherjee. As always, a pleasure listening to you. Uh, for all of those who do not know, Dr. Mukherjee was also my professor at college. And uh, we go back many, many years, so I grew up around her. It means a lot, especially more uh, if somebody who you've always looked up to growing up uh, reads out your bio. Uh, I also think that I need to figure out a way to shorten my bio because I think that took an exceedingly long amount of time. Uh, whereas there are people who've, uh, who've been in business longer than I've been alive. So uh, a mental note for later. A very warm welcome all of our dear participants who've come in. I can see there's more than 350 people online on Zoom, thousands of people watching us live from various, uh, uh, from various technological uh, platforms, be it Facebook, be it YouTube, we're currently live everywhere. And uh, it gives me great pleasure. I've, I've personally been looking forward to this session for a while uh, on, the, on this session, which is technology and education. And I'm so fortunate that we have three fantastic speakers with us uh, for all the participants of today's webinar. You're in for a, a real treat because I think there's a lot of things that we're going to learn from them. So without any further ado, let me uh, start off uh, today's session. We we'll start off with Ajay for today. Uh, we've uh, we've actually had a little chance to chat with all of the speakers before, uh, and I actually uh, was very curious about the way they ran their businesses because all of them are uh, quite exemplary in the in the way that they do it, and that I feel that there's a lot to learn uh, from them. And uh, I asked him asked them what they wanted to talk about, and so some of the questions we have for today are based on that. Um, I am I'm not a mind reader. I do not know what questions are going on in people's minds. So for all of you participants, please feel free to write your questions, comments while this webinar is going on, on the chat section or the Q&A section. And we promise to take up a few of the questions towards the end. 
we'll keep it to about an hour the first session which is technology and education and i guess here we go so uh, as dr mukherjee has already given us uh, the the proper official version of uh, fajr's bio i will talk about just a couple of things about him which i found very interesting so he's as you as all of you are already aware uh, he's been the global vp of nokia and uh, he's been running nokia for till december but now he's more focused on the manufacturing end of things uh, what is very interesting with him is uh, uh, he has uh, he has a long nomadic experience from his in his life and he's traveled to many many countries and what he's done uh, as part of that he's collected magnets right through his time and he's taken these magnets and he's put them all over his house to a point that now he's run out of place to keep magnets in his house that's ajay mehta for you he has no place sir uh, ajay mehta who he, he who has no place left at his home for magnets from his many many experiences uh, in uh, in traveling across across time uh, thank you very much for joining us today my first question to you will be on uh, on your interest in uh, of course if you could tell us a little bit about your time and work at nokia uh, because i think every indian's first phone has been a nokia uh, i can definitely talk about myself that that brick that you could throw at anyone and kill them ha- acts as a flashlight and also great phone right so how uh, the digital transformation on the, on nokia's end of things has been uh, and also uh, then we'll get into what how you've been envisioning uh, your second innings so we'll keep that for later but first let's hear about a little bit of your time at nokia and how the lockdown has been for you sure thank you very much uh, megdud and thank you dr mukherji and uh, thank you for having me on this po- uh, panel professor and uh, and mrs uh, roy choudhury uh, it's a real pleasure to be here as part of the techno india group uh, uh, panel and it was a very enlightening talk by dr sarkar also um i love the analogy of uh, cholesterol and stress and i think we can extend that to technology uh in on in many uh, spheres i've seen people talk about the negativity of technology but we are all seeing the positivity of it also but yes we need to keep uh, you know keep it in balance uh, a little bit about uh, my experience in nokia so i've been with the nokia brand for 16 years but i can tell you every year that i spent in nokia was like being in a totally different company altogether Uh, started back in 2005 every year the competitors challenges been last uh nokia moved from and i'm getting a little technical here but they moved from the symbian operating system to the windows operating system which was the reason why we got acquired by microsoft and then microsoft having different plans uh, you know being more focused on the cloud and the enterprise space uh, we spun off as a startup back in 2016 and we lo- we emerged as hmd global which is the company and uh, we launched nokia on android phone so i've been part of this really exciting journey uh, it's been uh, it's been really uh, energizing for me at every step of the way uh it has been great fun to be part of an industry that has actually shaped uh, human evolution and consumer behavior in a big way uh, because smartphones are probably the f- the most universally used consumer product in the history of mankind where you have such a homogeneous experience cutting across billions of people and it has really changed and it's uh, it continues to change uh, the way we shape the world um a little bit about uh, i think megdud we had talked about the covid uh, situation yes this has been something that has been pretty uh, life changing i would say it would be i would call it i mean go be a little audacious and call it uh, humanity rebooted uh, we have seen pandemics in the past we have seen pandemics like the black deaths we have seen pandemics like the spanish flu they have brought permanent changes yes certain things remain the same but a lot changes black death wiped out 40% of europe and that changed entirely the the face of uh, the labor policies of europe and it stayed that way for many many years uh, the spanish flu actually if i look at india closer home uh, i mean it, the, the toll was around 18 million people and because of the indifference of the british uh, the you know they it sparked a certain degree of rebellion within india and it is said to be one of the causes of the independence independence movement to take root so there are a lot of permanent changes that happen as a result of the pandemic and i uh, see this one also uh, resulting in uh, in in a change for the better i would say in many ways but of course it has to be taken uh, taken in our stride so if i really look at um, 
uh, how I have reacted to the pandemic, there have been a certain things that have worked, uh, that have sped up and certain things that have slowed down. Uh, as a result of the pandemic, as you know, people have been, um, you know, they've been away, uh, at, uh, locked up at home, and therefore businesses have pretty much come, came to a grind, they came to a grinding halt for a couple of months. Uh, from that point of view, things slowed down. But uh, like you mentioned, I'm actually looking at uh, building a manufacturing hub in India, and everybody's reading about the geopolitical situation that's going on and the fact that until now, China has pretty much dominated the manufacturing space. And now we are seeing an acceleration of, uh, of some of that uh, happening in India, a lot of support from the government. So therefore, from that point of view, during COVID, things have, you know, while one part has slowed down, the other part has kind of gathered a lot of momentum for me. Uh, and we are looking to set up, uh, you know, create a huge manufacturing and sourcing uh, base here in India. That's been one of the changes. The other change that I've been seeing, and I think some of the, uh, you know, uh, Satya Nadella, for example, mentioned that what has happened in the last three months would have otherwise taken four to five years to happen. And this is the digital transformation that companies are undergoing. Even the way we uh, run our business has undergone a change in the last couple of months. Uh, while we used to have pretty much uh, an online and an offline approach. Now we are, we are seeing a blur between the two. We are seeing an omni-channel approach where you can walk into a store and order a device online to be delivered home, or you can order online and go and purchase it from a store. So a lot of transformation in the way that, um, uh, that, we, that we are operating uh, is what we are seeing, uh, at least within our organization as of now. Even these kind of webinars, you know, this is something we could have held even three years ago. Right, and now we are holding it now. It's not that there's some new technology that has emerged in the last three months. It has just been a change in the mindset. I mean, I know uh, the education department, my sister has become, is teaching me a thing or two about on technology these days because she's become so familiar with it and so comfortable with it. And it's such a fantastic thing to see because it opens up so many possibilities. You know, you don't have to be, you can be anywhere in the world and you are able to actually, um, you know, connect and, and uh, interact and engage with people. So I think this uh, disruption, if I may call it, will continue. We will see this industry 4.0 take root, and I'm sure Ved will uh, enlighten us a lot more than I can, but you will see the 5G technologies, once they start to roll out, uh, you will see uh, things like augmented reality, virtual reality, which will really change the way we run businesses, the way we, uh, you know, the way we retail, uh, the entertainment industry. Uh, we will also see uh, travel and tourism getting redefined. You could, you know, uh, in these COVID days, you could possibly sit in the comfort of your bedroom and, and travel to Greece and actually go on a guided tour where your guide is Aristotle or somebody. You know, it is, it's going to be a very, very different experience when it comes to tourism also going forward. Things like 3D printing. Uh, I was talking to somebody in the apparel industry the other day and Things like you can, you know, you can go online and with uh, with uh, the latest uh, latest industry 4.0 techniques, you can you can uh, put down the measurements of your suit and then go to a retail store where you have a 3D printing technique and a, a machine which just prints out uh, a suit for you. I'm being a little uh, crazy here, but you know these are the things that are likely to disrupt uh, a lot of what we do and actually. Uh, give us access and 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 the consumer is the better for it right so it makes a lot uh, um, you know make uh, gives adds a lot of value to the to the consumer last but not the least i think from an education standpoint uh, i think there is opportunity for a lot of positive disruption uh, we've been used to and all of us have gone through the education system where you study and then work uh, i think going forward it's going to be more about uh, career linked learning so you're going to be continuously learning. It's going to be skill focused. Uh, so many assets are available online. I mean, you have the Coursera's, you have the um, edX's and you have the Udemy's and, and so on, on uh, online where you have access to the best of content, uh, where, the, where the students have access to the best of contents. I think the role of academicians also is going to change going forward. It's going to be less about teaching. It's going to be more about facilitating. It's going to be more about mentoring. Uh, I think from a uh, from a skills point of view, all of us have to be a lot more agile, a lot more open to continuously learning new uh, techniques because uh, I was reading somewhere that 85% of the jobs that today's learners are going to have in 2030 have, are yet to be invented. So you can imagine 85% of the jobs in 2030 don't exist today. So, which means that we need to continuously upskill ourselves because technology is going to go at change at a rapid pace. Uh, and I think this COVID-19 has been a bit of a catalyst for that. 
So I'm very excited about um, what's going on. I think there are uh, huge opportunities that are coming up as a result of this disruption, new business models, new businesses, new ways of working. And uh, me being a, a, a technologist at heart, can't wait to really move forward in this new environment. So thanks again, Meg thanks again, Meghdoot. It's been a pleasure to be here and uh, back to you. Thank you very much, Ajay. I love the point that you made of uh, democratization of 5G technology, because I'm personally looking forward to that very much. Uh, I do have a, an Oculus Quest at home, and I know what it feels like. It's like having your own device, a virtual reality device at home, which uh, basically gets you transported everywhere. And I think that's been my best friend during the COVID time. For once, I can actually take a walk in Hyde Park or do Tai Chi, uh, you know, by the shores of, uh, of the Atlantic Ocean. It's something that, you know, it's actually democratization of these technologies is going to make sure that these, these things reach out to people's homes a lot more easily. And especially because we've seen how fast this technology has changed as well, right? I remember uh, the first time I experienced virtual reality was uh, in 2015 at Stanford uh, at the V Labs, and we uh, we actually went in and experienced it. And we had this massive uh, headset. We had to plug it in, and then there were 16 thick cables connected to the roof of the room, and then mapping the whole place. And now you have all of that in a $400 box, right? And with the controllers and everything, you don't even need a you don't even need a computer or a phone to connect with it. It's got its own processing power, 64 gigabytes of space, enough to run, you know, your 10. 10, 15 games and it's, you know, great, great experience. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. I think in terms of education as well in the country, uh, provided the, uh, the bandwidth is supporting, you know, in, a country, in our country, I think accessibility of technology is all, always, uh, has always been a problem. Uh, even with the new education policy, we're seeing that a lot of it talks about technology at, a, at the school level, but for the implementation of thereof, we'll have to make sure that everybody has access to the same kind of yeah. uh, internet and bandwidth. Yeah, sorry, one point on that. When 5G comes in, when you have the fixed wireless access, then you will see that uh, the bandwidths, even in the rural markets and across the country will uh, will increase, you know, multifold. And, and that's when, that's the big opportunity that 5G uh, presents to us. Not, the, not only does it provide, provide us faster speeds, but it'll also provide us wider coverage. So that's that's going to be very, very exciting to watch. I think that's going to be a transformational shift in the industry itself, right? Everyone will finally have access to really high speed internet sitting at their homes, irrespective of whether they are in, uh, in Kolkata or Kalikat or in Kolhapur. So that, I think that's very interesting. I also really love the, the point that you raised about lifelong learning, how you said that, you know, it's going to be uh, the end of, okay, I finish school or I finish college and it's the end of my education because uh, we, we see in the panel today itself, all three of you, when I spoke to, spoke to all of you, all of you were very excited about learning about technology from your kids who are of various ages again. So I think, you know, you have, you, between the three of you, you have kids aged eight to 19, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe two. five to 19. Two, two, there's a two year old. No, no, 22, 20, almost. 22, 22, <laughs> 22 right. So say five to 22, I guess that's the age gap. And I think, you know, as, as lifelong learners, this, we have to have that mindset that, okay, no matter what happens, no matter if you finish your schooling or your college, there is no end to learning because it's something that becomes part of you same way that you look that you're constantly on the hunt for, I don't know, like a nice house or, you know, a car or whatever, an aspirational education will also become part of your lives. And I'm personally, as an educator, I think, uh, uh, very excited about what that has to bring to us. So thank you very much, Ajay, for your, uh, for your wonderful insights on that. Uh, let's move on to our next speaker. And of course, Ajay, we'll come back to you with questions later on. I'm sure a lot of our, I can already see the questions pouring in on all the platforms. Uh, let's move on to our next speaker. Uh, I think I'll take Vivek on after this. Uh, I think we had discussed that we'll get uh, Ved in, but I, I think I'm going to keep him a little bit, wait, waiting, uh, keep him waiting a little bit. Uh, let's have Vivek and we're going to talk about uh, about his time at Godrej. Uh, I think Godrej is a consumer, as, as a consumer brand, is a household name in India. And, you know, the first, I think, ever since you are uh, born in an Indian household, if you don't have a, a Godrej uh, Almira, I don't think that's an Indian household, right? I think everyone's had it at some point. And, and then again, you know, Godrej has since then gone into various other consumer tech. And Vivek, as, as a whole time director at Godrej Consumer Products Limited, has been at the very brink of that and forefront of that uh, that change. 
He's a uh, so one quick little trivia about all three speakers today. All of them are from Calcutta, and I think that we build relatability in that term, right? When ever since time immemorial, if you met somebody at in a in a in a forest at some point and you bumped into it, them the first reaction would be that okay, let's kill the other person. Second reaction would be <laughs> if you're not killing them, then what is it that binds us together? Oh, you're from that village. I am also from that village. You know, so and then again with things like religion, things like country, we always find ways of relatability. So for the audience today, all three of them are from Calcutta. They're all students of La Martiner, and they're all classmates, in fact. Uh, and we'll talk about that as well. So very interesting thing about Vivek, uh, he is uh, somebody who writes. He's a, he writes a blog regularly. It's called Monday-8am.com, where for the last three or four years, every single week, 300 weeks consecutively, he's been talking. He's been writing in long form about leadership. And uh, we would, of course, want to learn about your blog, Vivek. A subtle little plug here, so you get some at least 300 possible new subscribers to your blog, but also about your love for football, about your love for online education, your time at Godrej, and of course, uh, how Godrej has been uh, at the forefront of, uh, of corporate startup engagement in the country. I'm personally very interested to hear about that story, how you've been acquiring businesses left, right, and center, and keeping Godrej uh, ever innovative uh, for the days to come. So over to you, Vivek, uh, looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much, uh, you know, Megdut. I love your energy. I love your passion. It's such a pleasure uh, being on the panel with you. And of course, uh, it's wonderful to be with my good friends here. You know, Ajay, who is such a true magnet and uh, Ved as well, whose thinking and approach I so greatly admire. And thank you, Dr. Mukherjee. Thank you, uh, Dr. Roy Chaudhary uh, and Mrs. Roy Chaudhary for uh, having us here. Uh, it's, a, it's a real honor being part of this wonderful initiative that Techno India has. Uh, uh, as, uh, you know, as Ajay will also say, uh, both of us are from Delhi. So greetings from New Delhi. Uh, though I'm not quite sure how to describe the last few months. Uh, difficult, perhaps, uncertain, uh, volatile. For many of us, we have been adjusting to working from home. And home has become our full-time office. There is this surreal feeling where almost every day starts feeling the same and no one is quite sure when we will ever get back to our previous lives, if ever. And at the same time, in spite of these challenges, I am feeling very blessed for the amount of time that I have been able to spend with my wife and our three children. Never in my life before was I able to spend this kind of quality time uh, with the family. And of course, like the rest of you, Zoom has become a new member of our family. At home, our kids have become used to learning online. My oldest daughter, who goes to university in the US, has decided to do her semester from Delhi and is keeping US hours. The other two kids have also adjusted to the new lifestyle. My wife, Rupika, who works with the Kalyas Satyarthi Children's Foundation on children's rights, has been running programs to train and develop virtual volunteers. Rupika also works with another organization called Each One Teach One that provides after-school programs for kids in municipal schools in Delhi. She and her team are working on online classes to teach these children. On the work front, as uh, Megdut was mentioning, Godrich Consumer Products is one of the largest home and personal care companies in India. Brands like Goodnight, Hit, Easy, Synthol, Godrich Protect, and Godrich Air are some of the brands that you might have used or heard about. We had actually decided to work from home a week before the lockdown. And within a few days, we had thousands of our employees work from home since we had invested in technology infrastructure ahead of the curve. Because we manufacture essential products, our team man, teams managed to get most of our operations back on, on track uh, very quickly. Uh, it was great to see the adrenaline rush in the team. Our product development life cycles crashed from months to weeks, and we have launched more new products in the last three months than in the last three years. There is an amazing spirit of collaboration Teams are finding new ways to do things. As Ajay was mentioning, 
the organization has embraced digitization in a big way and is looking at harnessing technology much more aggressively across its operations. I remember seeing a cartoon some time back on who is driving digital transformation in your company. Is it the CEO or is it the CIO or is it COVID-19? Clearly, it has been COVID-19 that is really accelerating the move to digital. While work from home does have many advantages, we are also dealing with several issues. Working mothers and dual career couples are finding it quite difficult to manage their responsibilities at home along with the expectations at work. Work hours are also getting elongated with the increasing boundaries blurring between work and home. So we've had to establish new norms for our team members to better define these boundaries. Beyond the working hours, we are also grappling with how to shape culture when some people are working from home and some are in the factory and in the field. A lot of learning tends to happen by people working together. And so how do you ensure that our younger or less experienced employees get the right learning opportunities when working from home? There are no easy answers to these issues. And these are things that we will have to grapple with over the next few months as we learn to live with COVID. As I speak to you today, I have logged in from my laptop. With me, I also have my phone. I have an iPad. I'm on a broadband connection. And I also have a dongle by my side in case my broadband connection crashes. My wife and children also have their own laptops or tablets to be able to go online whenever they choose to. About less than a kilometer away from our house is Vivekananda Camp, a slum community of a few thousand households. This camp is right next to the British school and the American Embassy School in Delhi. In this community, there is a girl, Isha, who lives with her family, her father, mother, and two other siblings. Life has been quite hard for her family post the pandemic. Her father, who runs a chai stall, found his work coming to a halt and earnings dwindle post the pandemic. He is now trying to restart his business. Isha is a sincere and earnest student. She is very keen to do some of the online classes that are being offered. The family has only one phone in their household and the father has to take the phone with him when he goes to work. So when he comes back in the evening, all the kids fight over who will have dibs on the phone. Isha is worried that she is falling behind and won't be able to make up for this lost time. Stories like Isha's are playing out in crores of households of India today. Only 23% of urban households have access to a computer. For rural households, that number is 4%. And even if you factor in mobile connectivity over a mobile phone, only 42% of urban households have access to the internet, while it is only 15% of rural households. And so for those who use the mobile internet, 40% face a poor connection, while 57% face signal issues. Not to mention the future, the frequent fire power cuts that we are all used to in India. And this is the reality of the digital divide. Knowledge has become the exclusive privilege of those who can go online. The divide has become much more pronounced during the pandemic. In government schools in Delhi, attendance has ranged between 25 to 30% recently. And remember, this is not just about internet connectivity. Recently, some of us might have read the heartwarming, heartbreaking story of a young girl in Kerala who committed a suicide because she did not have a device at home to join online learning sessions. And so while we can extol these virtues of technology and talk eloquently about 5G and 3D printing, we really need to find ways to urgently address this issue. 
we are running the risks of enrollment and attendance plummeting across schools in India. Students struggling with any learning issues are also at a big disadvantage. There are serious worries of children being driven to labor or made to work at home. Violence against children could also see a spike. Girls are especially vulnerable. So I would urge all of us to find the collective will and take concrete actions to stem this huge learning loss. The increasing digital divide as a result of this pandemic could reverse some of the progress that we've made as a country over the last decade. We really need to work together to find solutions to connectivity, bandwidth, affordability, and access to devices. Let me stop there, Meghdoot. Thank you so much, Vivek. I think there were so many, uh, you took a turn, like uh, your, your speech started on a very positive note and, and then it went into a, into a place where now we're all thinking, you know, are we, you know, I think your privilege, questioning your privilege, I think becomes one of the first things that you do at a, at a time like the pandemic. Because for a lot of us, we're like, okay, great, work from home, reducing so much time, which I would have otherwise spent on traveling to work, et cetera, et cetera. But on the other side, there are a lot, there are all of these people who do not have access to learning, continued learning at this time, uh, and who do not have access to the basic necessities even to continue running their households at a time like this. So uh, it really falls down to us. I mean, and, and with every day that we have uncertainty about the pandemic, how long is this gonna last? How much of, a, uh, of an impact it's gonna have not only on the country's uh, economy, but on the, uh, on the very basis of what our country is based on. Uh, I think it's, it's a question that all of us should be asking ourselves and working towards. Uh, on this note, um, there was a question for uh, for Ajay, which was actually very uh, very interesting. But it, rather than asking it to Ajay, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask that to Ved. Question remains the same. I'm just gonna shift that. Sorry, Ajay, I'll ask you another question later because it's related. So because we were talking about the 5G, uh, and maybe Ajay, you can also add a couple of words on that. But uh, the question uh, is goes as follows: that uh, previously we were talking about 5G and how 5G is gonna be our savior in terms of technology. Uh, this is actually from one of your seniors in LMB. Uh, so uh, Mr. Ghosh Dasidhar, Aurup Al Ghosh Dasidhar, he was all three of your senior at LMB. He saw the post on LinkedIn that I'd made and he's here, he's live with us. He asked the question that, you know, in the time that it takes for us as a country to adopt 5G at a democratic level, uh, it's going to create, don't you think it's going to create a further divide in the, in the between the haves and have nots uh, in the country. So a couple of words from you on that, Ajay, what are your feelings on that? And I'll jump into uh, Ved uh, and his... A couple his of things that I think uh, Vivek uh, make, making some, made some really, really fantastic points, like he always does, of course. Uh, uh, on this, um, you know, this digital divide, uh, the industry is also working at a hectic pace to try and overcome that. And there are essentially two parts to it. One is the connectivity, and the second is the device. Today, if you see, there are about 450 million people on the internet, uh, citizens on the internet, and uh, that, you know, either through smartphones and 70, 80% of them actually are accessing the internet through the smartphones and the balance through, uh, through desktops. Yet there are close to 400 million feature phone users. You know, those are the basic phones, what we in our terminology call the ITUT phones, which is the one with the keypad which has just about, you know, you may have some limited connectivity, but it by and large is a, is a voice and text uh, device. Now, what we in the industry are doing is to see how we can port those three to 400 million people from feature phones to smartphones by making the smartphones more affordable. So we are uh, working, I mean, the ecosystem is working because it requires a low cost hardware, which means a much lighter hardware, which means a very different operating system. So how do we actually lower the uh, cost of ownership of the device is one thing that we are doing. The other one on the 5G, yes, as uh, the more we delay, the more the divide uh, can be uh, aggravated further. But I know that uh, the 5G spectrum auctions, et cetera, are on around the corner. And when the 5G, uh, when 5G starts to roll out, which I anticipate should happen in the next 12 to 15 months, uh, the, the big thing about 5G, I mean, people just talk about the speed, but really 5G will be very disruptive. You need to think about, if you see, when we move from 2G to 3G, 4G, we moved from a feature phone to a smartphone. It was disruptive. 
Now, when we move from 3G, 4G, we move to 5G, it will be disruptive across the board. The advantage of 5G also is, like I said, the fix to wireless, which means that you have a Wi-Fi everywhere all the time. Right, So the coverage would mean that the footprint of this connectivity and bandwidth would extend to the, uh, to the tier four rural markets also. So that is an opportunity for us to make sure that we really democratize technology because in India, I totally agree, it's the privileged few that are having access to the education and, and you, know, you don't need to go very far from your homes to find. We ourselves have been um, you know, uh, handing out devices to, to, to people around us, to uh, staff that uh, work, you know, work around us and so on, to get their children to connect. Because the other day somebody came over, he didn't have a phone because his daughter was online because she had a class and he brought a regular phone with a different number so I couldn't reach him, just to give you an empirical evidence, very much like the one that uh, Vivek mentioned. So yes, this digital divide will get aggravated if we don't rush it, but the two critical pillars of uh, of bridging the divide is one, the affordability and the cost of ownership of the device itself. And the second is the connectivity, which we believe will happen through 5G. So the first one I would see, I would say would start to accelerate in the next few months because we are working on that. Hopefully by early next year, we will have very, very affordable uh, devices, which will, which will provide a great experience to, uh, to the consumers. And then 5G, maybe six to eight months after that. That's my view for now. But let's see how it all pans out. You know, it's difficult to predict. Right. Uh, Ved, can we maybe now have a little bit uh, on, on your take on this particular topic? But before getting into that, I would like to quickly also introduce Ved in my way. So he is somebody who claims he has the best job in the world. He's a digital evangelist and business innovation lead at TCS UK. And uh, what's very interesting, uh, while we were having a conversation before, he told me, you know, why are the greatest minds in the world not solving the world's biggest problems? Why are they all in advertising? Why are they trying to get your eyeballs? Why is it always about clickbait? And uh, it's something that really got me thinking as well. And I'm sure there's a lot of things we can learn from you as well. Uh, Ved, my question, my first question to you, obviously, is to if you can, uh, you know, continue your strain of thought on, on this whole accessibility issue of education. Uh, multiple questions have come in about that and how uh, you were in, in a country like India, where uh, the basic bread and butter is still, and if at the end of the day, how are we talking about uh, making this a digital first nation? Uh, and also a little bit about, of course, your work at TCS and about uh, international teams. I know you work with a bunch of very interesting, very smart people from around the world. So your work from home experience has not been very different from your regular experience because it's just like, you know, cool people that you work with. And also about the need for interdisciplinarity in our institutions, uh, how that will pan out, how your experience at TCS UK uh, makes you think what are the what are the main skills that we have to take out uh, from our kids uh, to who we are leading into the future how how their uh, futures will be benefited uh, if they can pick up some essential skills right now so over to you uh, Mr. Wade Sen. Thank you thank you um, uh, let me also start by saying thank you very much to everybody behind the show uh, obviously um, uh, Dr. Ayatudhuri, Professor Ayatudhuri Dr. Mukherjee, and of course, you make the, um, and, and not the least, all the people who are behind the scenes to make this happen. Listening to Ajay and Vivek, the one thing that strikes me is sort of you kind of, you look forward to all the exciting things that are coming, and then you look behind and you see the people who are effectively left behind. And, and uh, I'm really reminded of a phrase that I think, uh, I think is, is creditable to Kevin Kelly, who is the uh, well known tech author. He said, the future is already here. It's unevenly distributed, right? So I, I think that's a reality. And, and because I live in London, uh, although right now I'm in Kolkata, um, I don't think this is an India problem only. Um, I think digital divides are, are popping up and are being accelerated by the COVID-19 scenario across the world. And although uh, I think Ajay has very eloquently spoke about, spoken about the device aspect of it, it manifests in other ways as well. People, some people don't have space. You know, it's nice to say you can you can study from home, but if you don't have the right environment. So in a number of different ways, we are seeing this pan out. I think this is not unique or new uh, in that if you look back on history, you will find every new technology creates an element of divide between haves and have nots. Um, you know, uh, if you consider fire as the first technology, some people to start with had it and were eating, you know, different kind of food from those who didn't. So I think there is a, there is a process through which society catches up. 
and certain societies that put value on equality catch up slightly faster. Some societies rely on inequality, inequality to kind of uh, be a fuel for growth, the US for example, and, and there the divides lingers for longer. And I think you'll see those kinds of um, uh, variations here as well. And I have no doubt that with every new technology, not just 5G, we will experience this over and over again. So it's a matter of, you know, they say the, 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 the value of a society is not how far the, the best in the society are, but how good is the life of the worst off in the society? So I, I guess that's where we want to come back. And, and that's at the end of the day a policy issue, but let's put that to one side. I did want to say that um, there is also a, an aspect of wellness that I think is being touched upon, uh, by Vivek certainly touched upon it. Uh, and I think before that as well. Uh, and I'm going to be in your um, seat Meghdut, in a couple of days time because we're hosting an, a global event with our clients on wellness, which has become a really important new issue because um, should employers care about employees' wellness is that, and to do that, do we have to know about your living conditions? Um, and is that overreaching? Is that, is that an intrusion on your personal space by the organization? These are tough questions that we are having to answer now as organizations. And no doubt technology has a role to play in all of those conversations as well. Um, I think that the, you know, one of the things that I always, I'm a technology optimist. So, um, you know, bear with me um, if I sound too bullish at times. So Mark Anderson, who founded Netscape um, and also was instrumental in the kind of global spread of the internet, uh, used this phrase, software is eating the world. Um, I think we've all had to heard that somewhere or the other. And I think that translates fundamentally to the fact that the value of almost every product we consume or indeed every service is captured in the software and the technology. Uh, you can look at a car, you can look at your phone, um, you can look, even look at connected thermostats. You know, the, the, for what you pay, you're paying for the software as much as the hardware, probably more for the software increasingly. And it's worth remembering that that is the world that the ch that children of today are growing up into. Our children, all the students that you've got, this is the world we're facing up to. Uh, and I'd just like to touch upon some of the aspects of this as I go. But to your earlier point, um, yes, I, I, I'm very lucky that I work in a cross-domain, cross-industry, and cross-cultural environment. So I get to kind of pick and choose, and I, I, you know, I, I get the for, you know incredible fortune of being able to see what's going on in so many different spaces. You know, whether it's banking one day, or whether it's education the next year, or you know, energy the third. And what I can see is that there are ideas everywhere. Uh, and so the reason for my being so positive is that. I see that the world is changing. I see that you know, every day people are coming up with incredibly great ideas. Um, and, and therefore I do think that some of the world's bigger problems are getting solved, however slowly. And if I, if I break that down, um, I think that you've got healthcare, environment, government, um, our economic models, and education as the five big challenges that if you think about the world, these are, these are what we're grappling with. I absolutely believe that the next 10 years will be the decade of healthcare because there are so many you know, amazing things happening from genomics, telemedicine, bioelectronics, you know, um, you've got uh, you know, gene editing, microbial analysis. And I don't think healthcare will be recognizable both in terms of the science of it or the delivery of it over the next 10 years. So that's happening. If I look at environment, not enough is happening, but perhaps collective self-preservation will make sure that enough investment goes into it, otherwise we won't have a planet. And all of this is kind of pointless. Uh, this discussion. So I think environmental uh, changes will happen. I don't think, uh, I'm not that hopeful that government uh, and economic models will change dramatically, primarily because the people who hold the key to the change stand the most to benefit from the current status quo. Um, which brings us to education. And I think Dr. Shankar also uh, used this phrase, and I like, you know, very similar to what I thought of, which is, it's not just about the way we teach or how we teach, it's also the what and the why. So if I take those and little bits. If I look at how we teach, you know, obviously the first brush we all know, we are seeing distance education, we're seeing, you know, um, the use of mobile, we, we talked about holograms earlier, which was really interesting, interactive, why? Right? there's a lot of tech in the classroom, that's great. But I think uh, what businesses have uh, discovered, and I'm sure Vivek and Ajay will bear me out, is that technology doesn't make the change. The change happens when you can change the way you work using the new technology. If you simply do what you used to do, but with better tech, yeah, you may get a little marginal benefit. 
but our ability to change the way we do things is quite, you know, is what brings the power. So if you if you check out, for example, Salman Khan, the Gaibian Khan Academy, he has a really interesting premise around inverting the classroom. You know, so you learn on your own and you come to the class to discuss, which actually is how most of us have been trained if you were to go to business school. But my question is, why don't we teach history like that in, in middle school? Why can't students learn about it or read about it at home and come and discuss it? Because when you start asking the why questions, you build that much more critical thinking. You know, you, you of course run the risk that every biology class becomes a discussion of evolution because if you start asking the why questions, then, you know, so that requires a certain level of participation and, and encouragement from the teaching community as well. Then we get to what do we teach? And that's really interesting because, you know, the what and the why questions are entering. Why are we teaching children? And what are we teaching them for? Uh, and again, here I will refer to Ken Robinson, who has a, who has a most fabulous um, TED talk. Uh, and, and he points to the fact that most of our education systems today are designed around industrial era requirements. In a nutshell, we are training children for middle management, for bureaucracy, you know, that layer. Um, and, and the world has changed. And as the world changes, you get the mismatch between skills we are producing and skills that are required. So on the one hand, as you know, Ajay pointed out again, there are so many new jobs that will appear. But as of today, I read a report that says there are 7 million jobs today that are not fulfilled because there aren't skills available for those jobs. So you can imagine you've got, you've got drought and floods at the same time, right? You have you know, these amazing new jobs that we don't know how to do, but there aren't people enough to do today's jobs. So how do you fill that gap? How fast can you do that is a really, really challenging question. And the model of education, therefore, um, you know, again, uh, Ajay briefly touched upon it, study for the first 20 years of your life and then use it forever, I think is way outmoded. We all know that, um, you know, so sometimes when I look back, I think of myself as a byproduct of the education system. Um, I think that a lot of our education is just in, just in case. You learn a little bit of a lot of different subjects, just in case you become an architect and need the trigonometry or just in case you become a, you know, physicist and you need the advanced calculus. There's a lot of just in case education. There's a question to which I don't have the answer, which is how much do we need to keep in our heads? Because we started outsourcing memory, we've outsourced knowledge, we've outsourced calculation, computation. So where is the, what is the critical minimum amount of knowledge, information that we need to keep in our heads? And that's what education should focus on. And everything else, as we know, is outsourced. Now, there are people like Ray Kurzweil who will tell you that in the next 25 years, you'll be able to plug our brains into the, you know, into the internet. Uh, and then, you know, we will be able to singularity as they call it, where you can learn directly by plugging stuff into your brain and people like Elon Musk are working on it. I'm not even going there. I am saying that there is a, there is a, the pandemic has made one question very clear in my head, which is what is education for? Because I feel very privileged and, and this has been touched upon. I feel really privileged. Any one of us who has a home, a family, um, you know, a job, you know, we are already in the 1%. Okay. Uh, and, and there are so many people who are you know, desperately impacted by, by the loss of job, by the anxieties involved. But I, I, I really felt at some point that why is people complaining because their commute is affected or because they've got, you know, they can't go to their favorite restaurant. So I think there's a, I think I go back to the education point because I think it's really important to say, why do we educate people? Is it to maximize our own careers or is it to, is, is the social good of education something we've lost along the way? If I bring it back with technology, and that if now technology allows us to customize, individualize education, to do it in a completely different way, if you have to design it from scratch, could we solve these problems? Could we solve the why questions of education as well in a better way uh, than perhaps um, in the hand-me-down education system that we have currently? And you're in the business, uh, and I'd love to hear the thoughts of others on the panel as well. But well, that's, that's where I stand on this. I'll stop now before I ramble on, but, but you know, I see a lot of change and, and a potential bright future, but there's a lot of work to be done. Thank you so much for that technology optimist uh, point of view. I think that we, we need all the optimism in the world, especially at a time when we are, when I, I feel like personally, I feel like I'm living in a movie where every day I wake up and it's the same day but I just have to do like different tasks and kind of figure it out. So I can see progress, but at the same time, I don't see personal progress.
progress as much right when you're not interacting with people around you who you're so attuned to learning from i'm i'm one of those people who learns from people a lot better than from textbooks or or whatever uh, i feel like i'm not learning as much as i would like to hence i guess these webinars where i get to talk about talk to people like yourselves and try and figure out okay maybe maybe we are in the right direction and i really like the point that you raised about bare again uh, being one of the uh, foremost futurists in the world talking about how the world is changing talk about singularity uh, you talked about ken robinson and about how his i actually think we watch the same kind of content i'm guessing you're also a big fan of yuval noah harari and you love listening to his 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 story and his uh, his talks about how technology kind of you know seeps into it Uh, if you if you want to you know i'm guessing you have something to say on that because you were uh, you unmuted yourself no i was just going to agree violently with you about about uh, the fact that we have a lot of common content interest but but at least you know there's there are certainly enough people pushing ahead with what could happen uh, and and i feel that uh, when we have these kinds of conversations uh, especially with the perspective that vivek brought in we also need to think about you know what what uh, needs to not happen sure so the same way that when you are making a 3d printer you know it can be used to make a life changing drug or it can be used to create a gun you know so the same thing and then of course the laws uh, the legalities of that need to be very well maintained i did no i did no an article on that the pandora's box that is technology uh, about 5 years ago i think i was working at this uh, legal tech firm back then in france i was the only non french speaking person in this very french company and i don't know why i thought it would be a good idea to talk about this and now it gets me i, I haven't given that any thought in the last 5 years suddenly after listening to you way i think uh, i need to go back to like writing about the future of technology and stuff maybe some things will get unearthed and i will i would definitely love to collaborate actually in fact with all three of you in uh, in talking about where the future leads because at the end of the day the same way we need doers of course we need to keep doing new things in our lives and we need to keep innovating but we also need thinkers right it's it's very important at this very interesting brink of time that we're in uh, where where we get to decide how the world will move forward from the comfort of our couches i think we need it's the need of the hour to keep some stuff written down as well and to keep them documented which is why again big ups to vivek on maintaining your monday atm blogs I'm, i'm a huge fan already i've been reading up about the stuff you've been writing on leadership we did get a question uh, very recently about uh, about somebody who wants to talk about uh, who actually basically uh, told me make do you've been talking about enabling the youth of the country what about the old people right what about the people who uh, who are past their 60s for them maybe the regular use of technology is uh, maybe not that important but at the same time if they're not able to keep attuned at least a little bit you know i i saw that with my own grandmother she didn't have access to a smartphone until uh, two or three months ago i think and i was really missing her i hadn't seen her in a while so what i did one day was i just bought a phone on amazon i know i could can't go to her place right now now cuz she's old and you know my grandfather's there they both like 80 plus so i just bought a smartphone and i sent it to her house and i said oh this is a little gift hope you enjoy it at least we can do whatsapp calls now and i can see your face and i cannot i cannot stress on this enough i think my grandma was so overwhelmed by it firstly she was very intimidated she was like oh my god what is this pandora's box i don't want to open it but then my cousin was who was also around kind of took her through it for the first couple of days and when she gave us her first whatsapp call it was a moment of pure joy it was just like her seeing us after you know 4 5 6 months i was not in town for a while and she saw the whole family and she got so emotional about it she's like oh this is great i didn't even know you could do this right so for people like that and again this is a very small uh, example it's a very personal emotional example but also in terms of keeping them uh, updated with what's happening right now uh how is how can technology play a role for the future rather than me answering that i would love for our uh, for a very esteemed panel today to take that on vivek why don't you take a shot at it how do you think uh, the older people uh, are getting uh, you know uh, affected by technology and what more could be done on that on that field over yeah, to you no. vivek no no i think i let uh, our experts ajay and vedh you know answer this question i think clearly uh there is some rethink required in devices also in terms of you know how do we think about you know different devices so ajay you know what's your view on do we need to think about uh, specific devices for older people uh, also 
Yeah. Before I get into that, Megdoot, next time you need, I'm I'm assuming the phone you sent your grandmother was a Nokia first. <laughs> you get your phone done. I'll have one organized sent across. Somebody set it up and train her. Not to worry. Uh, <laughs> on a lighter note, uh, but Vivek, yeah, no, uh, yes, for sure. I think um, there are features on the smartphones which uh, which help um, you know senior citizens. It's uh, in terms of you know size of the font. It also is in terms of um, making them more uh, rugged and, and, and you know easier to use. Uh, but I think it's uh, at the end of the day, it is a psychological block that needs to be mm. overcome. If there are adequate training methodologies and training techniques and and ways to train uh, even the senior citizens, uh, it actually is not very difficult. The way yeah. the software is built, it's very intuitive. Um, if a if a child, you know, under the age of six or seven, can pick it up and start working on it, there's no. It just comes intuitively. So, uh, like I said, going forward, I think this is going to be important for all of us to have that agility to unlearn and then relearn. It is important for us to continuously pick up these new skills, even from the technology side. I think what we try to do is to try and make the interface and make the usage as simple as possible and as intuitive as possible. Uh, I think what we've not been really good at is really training, uh, the training at the last mile is to really get that understanding. If you really see most of us and, and me yeah. probably use 10 to 20 percent of what the phone can actually deliver, you know, the bare bones basics that we go in for. Uh, of course, uh, uh, Ved is probably percent, and I'm sure Vivek also will be close to close to that. But I can say that in general, you know, there are a lot of uh, features in the phone that we don't use. So my point is, yes, there are some features that need to be built into the phone to help the senior citizens. But I think more importantly, I think we need to have the patience and the right content and the channels to be able to train them so that they really see it as an extension of themselves and not this huge audacious piece of technology that they get overwhelmed by. Yeah, you know, and I agree Thank with that, Ajay. Before you say anything, Ved, one sec. Oh, sorry, Vivek, you had a comment. I will yeah, not talk What I was saying, what I was saying, Meghdoot was, you know, at the end of the day, uh, as you were saying, Meghdoot, what you did with your grandmother, if every single grandchild can take the responsibility yeah. of trying to ensure that they can teach their grandparents, I, you know, I've seen uh, my young kids, you know, how they teach my mother. That's the way to really make some of this change happen. And I think, over time, we have to get a little bit more empathetic in terms of website designs, content design. Uh, so there is some user interface, I think, things that we can also do to try and make it far more inclusive, uh, yes. you know, in, in some ways, I think. Absolutely. So I guess, I guess the main message, again, Vivek's message here is that we have to look towards more human-centric design yeah. because a lot of the things we create are also like, you know, that's what the, the, that's what most CEOs, especially in India, we, we're not a very human centric uh, innovation kind of a country. So we, we think that we know a lot of things and we, we just build them on a whim without trying and understanding uh, the users at the end. So design thinking, I think, is going to be a very big part of, uh, of the future of this collective future we're talking about. Uh, and on an ending and on a closing note, we actually have kind of run out of time, but I want, I want to hear something from you, Ved. Uh, not the exact question that I'd asked Ajay uh, on this one. I would like to turn it a little bit for you. How do you think from your experience of all the kind of brands that you've seen as well, how, how do you think we can bring uh, the older generations back into the workforce? Because I think a lot of people above the age of 60 find it extremely difficult to while away their time. I mean, some of them might be entrepreneurs. They're figuring out ways to do mentoring companies, startups, blah, blah, blah. But using technology, do you think there's ways that we can, uh, we can, we can uh, create a second, third innings maybe for some of these uh, people from the next uh, generations and uh, how it can help, if you believe at all, how it can help, uh, you know, increase the levels of well-being. Uh, for these elderly gentlemen, because again, our next session is on well-being, and maybe you can do a segue into that. This is all from me, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for tuning in today. I think great sites of great number of insights from all our guests, and for the last answer, over to Mr. Wade Sen. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, everyone. Have a lovely day. Thank you for teeing me up. I, that's exactly the point I was going to make. I, I want to challenge that perception a little bit. I think we are sometimes, I, I, although of course there are uh, quite a few people who are elderly and need the help. Uh, I think we might be in danger sometimes of stereotyping um, the generation. Um, I just want to point out to Vivek and Ajay that it's not that far away. Um, <laughs> but um, 
but i think that um, what we're wait, seeing wait speak for yourself huh yeah. <laughs> it's a state of mind <laughs> um so i think that there, there's a there what we're seeing across the world now is that life expectancy has gone up dramatically so the what certainly in many parts of the world the idea that we work till 60 and then we retire that itself is being challenged so your point on a second innings is very valid people are being encouraged to find a second career that can start in your mid 50s um that will survive you another 20 years of you know active economic participation so i think there is there is certainly a generation um that is already taking shape that is fairly tech savvy that does not need the level of hand holding although of course there will be people who will need that um the other thing i think is uh, your the last point uh, is that human interfaces or human um design is is evolving we are finally at a point today when we don't have to learn how to use computers and technology technology is learning how to work with us so if you look at voice uh, and if you look at some of those essentially human interfaces i think in another 10 years time this problem may go away because you won't have to teach someone how to use the phone you know things that come out of the box will will be um, designed to work with human beings without us having to read a manual or figure things out so i'm really hopeful that that switch will also happen well being continues to be a fundamental issue and it has many many aspects it's too big a topic to me to, to sort of uh, you know really do justice to it but we should remember that it is both physical and mental and emotional um, and psychological and there are safety issues involved uh, unfortunately i think where technology um, should start is on the data i don't think we have data on well being we we are still very much in the world of kind of anecdotal information um since um you know a lot of well being is connected with information about people's you know state of mind state of homes social structures and and that is not currently in a shape that is accessible and should it become accessible we have to worry about privacy so i think there is a there's a bit of, bit of a minefield we have to cross but i have no doubt that that itself is a is a worthwhile problem to go after so i'm looking forward to the next panel on that